Um, I um, wel want to welcome Rich Diedrichson here today. Yes. This, I am Barb Summer, and we're doing an oral history, oral visual history interview for the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans Oral Visual History Project. It's June 8th, 2011, we're in the, and we're in the Golden Rule Building in St. Paul, Minnesota, in downtown. And I would like to ask you to say your name and tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little background. Okay. Well, my name is Richie Diedrichson, but the only person that calls me Richard is my mother. So I've been rich ever since I got in the Army. Um, I actually grew up, and most people called me Dick. And when I got to the Army, we had too many Richards in the platoon, so the sergeant says, you're going to be Richard, you're going to be Rich, you're going to be Rick, you're going to be Dick, and don't forget it, because he will. So that's how I got to be Rich, and I've been ever since uh, using that name. Um, I grew up in, Man in Mankato. I was actually born in Nebraska, but we moved there when I was two years old. And um, went to school, high school, everything there. Um, after high school, I kind of fooled around in two years of college, and after that I went into the Army. It was in the Army that I actually lost my hearing um, because of noise exposure. And um, coming back, I kind of fumbled around between jobs. Uh, hooked up with a rehabilitation counselor from the uh, Veterans Administration, and um, he helped me to decide what I wanted to do. I thought it, uh, I, I groped around with a lot of different types of jobs that I might be interested in. I started college as a chemistry major, believe it or not. Um, he got to talking to me about rehabilitation, um, what it entailed. Um, I got interested in it. It seemed like a good fit for me because um, I like working with people. I like the idea of a variety in my job and that. Um, and he encouraged me to consider working with people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so they actually paid for sign language classes for me and uh, sent me, they sent me to learn lip reading and after the first class, the uh, instructor said, you lip read better than you're going to when you get done with this class, so you don't need to come back. And so uh, that was my story of how I got into this racket. Um, tell after, us, oh, tell yeah. us a little bit more about the hearing loss and as a veteran, just a little, can you go into that a little bit? Well, actually, when I was in the service, I, I probably should have been wearing hearing protection, but um, in most of the uh, combat zones, in, in the boonies, we called it and that, most of us, um, we didn't want to carry anything we didn't need to carry. And um, when you're 19, 20 years old, no matter when people tell you, you know, this is going to come back and haunt you, um, you don't really believe that. And so, that was the biggest part of my uh, hearing loss was you know, the noise exposure. Uh, I was in a very noisy environment. Um, after that part of it, I guess the rest of it is attributable to age. <laughs> as, we, you know, as I get older, there's less things I want to actually listen to, I guess. And so you ended up going in and, and finding that, voca that the vocational rehab work was what you wanted to start doing. Is that, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, actually they did a, uh, a lot of um, testing and that kind of stuff, interest aptitude testing and that. Um, some of the things that I scored high on, it just amazed me. Uh, things like engineering and that kind of stuff. And I thought, nah, I don't think I want to do that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd rather work with people. And so in the course of talking with the person that was my rehabilitation counselor at the time, um, he actually suggested, you know, have you ever considered this? And I thought, well, no, not really. Um, and he, he explained what it entailed in that, sent me to the library, did a little bit of research in that, and that's what ended up as my career goal and my rehabilitation plan. Um, 
For some days, I wonder if that was accident or fate, but um, you know, I, I can't say that I've not enjoyed it. So. And so you ended up, tell us a little bit about how you started to get into the work that you're doing, or that you... You're Actually, um, when I was going to college, uh, I graduated from my master's degree in 1982. I, finished my undergraduate in 1980, and at that time they had just started the uh, Regional Service Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Mankato. And the first manager down there, a gentleman by the name of Joe Weber, walked in and introduced himself, and I noticed that on his lapel he had a first cavalry division um, insignia, and that was one of the units I served with, and so we got to talking about that. And uh, Joe, like myself, lost his hearing in the service. Uh, his as a result of malaria. And um, so when we started chatting, um, we got to be friends. And so I would visit him and his wife, who were both deaf. And that helped me polish up my sign language skills as well. When I started my internship, just by fate and chance, I guess, his office was directly across from mine. And so that, at that point in time, the regional service centers were co-located with the uh, vocational rehabilitation offices. So we were right across from each other. And um, I think it worked out well for both of us. It helped me with the, the chance to you know, kind of get used to, if I'm going to work with people who are deaf and hard of hearing, you know, it's just something that fits me. It does it fit my personality? Um, and I think from Joe's perspective, it was nice to have another person in the office that when you take a break, you can converse with. And I have to admit, in a selfish level, that was a big thing for me as well. Um, so that's how we kind of got into that. Um, he was one of the people that gave me a reference for my first job. and. Uh, I actually started working in 1982 with the Regional Service Center as a rehabilitation counselor. And back then, the Regional Service Centers were a co-partnership between the Department of Public Welfare and the Department of Rehabilitation Services, and our DBR, as we call it, the uh, Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, a division even of Vocational Rehabilitation. So I worked for the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation as a counselor, but I was assigned to the Regional Service Center because my work was with people who were deaf and hard of hearing. Um, so it's kind of a unique match. That stayed in place for about the first four years that I worked, and then the division split up. Uh, it was shortly after that that I transferred to work with the uh, Regional Service Center as a consultant, and that was in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Let's go back a little bit and um, describe the Regional Service Centers as they were when you first entered there, or first, first learned of them and started working with them. The, the way they were set up back then, you had a person that they called the Regional Manager, which was really just kind of a supervisor. Um, and they were also assigned some counties to do consultant work. They were employed by vocational rehabilitation, as was well my position, the rehab counselor. There were only two offices in the state of Minnesota to have rehabilitation counselors, and that was St. Cloud and Minneapolis. And then we had a regional consultant that was actually employed by the Department of Public Welfare and they did the other counties for the consultant work. And then we had a staff interpreter. And um, basically, we were breaking ground. I don't think that um, we had some concept of what we would like to do, but we really didn't have a model or a prototype to follow. Initially, a lot of our work was with deaf people. Uh, culturally deaf people, signing deaf people, and the reason for that was basically because they were the group of people that helped set up the regional service centers, 
And back then there were no real technological options. Um, I remember one of our projects being just getting TTYs into the um, voter registration places or the uh, county auditor's offices because even something as simple as calling and finding out where you vote, unless you had a friend that would interpret that call for you, you were stuck. If you walked down to him trying to write back and forth, you know, that was the nature of where services were. Um, a lot of interpreters, when I first started, still were friends of the family or someone that was a family member in that. Um, the concept of professional interpreters was very much in its infancy. Um, things as simple as an interpreter for a school system might earn six or seven dollars an hour and they were only paid for the hours that they were actually in the classroom interpreting. So if the student had a study hall or a gym class and didn't need the interpreter, they weren't paid for those hours. So it's a very, very unusual system. Um, the idea of assistive technology, about the only assistive technology I can remember actually being commonplace for your TTYs and maybe a few um, amplifying devices, if you would. And even them are very, very um, primitive, I guess is a polite way of putting it. Um, as far as assistive listening devices, uh, like a, a personal amplifier, I remember a fellow by the name of Bonham Cross, and if you haven't heard that name, you don't know how to hearing in the state of Minnesota. Bonham actually, to me, he is the godfather of assistive devices in Minnesota. He started out with things and figuring out with a cassette tape player, there was a way to rig them that you could take a microphone and when someone spoke into that, it, you could amplify it and bring it out of the speaker. And those were the first assistive devices I remember being used in the state of Minnesota um, long before we had the world famous uh, William Sound pocket talkers or some of your you know, more sophisticated stuff that we see nowadays. Bonham was rigging those kinds of things up. Um, he figured out that with your telephone coils, you could pick up a magnetic image that went around a wire loop that ran around the room. And the way he got the signal into that wire that ran around the room, he went down to Radio Shack and bought a 100 watt amplifier and then took out of this, the four ohm jack and the ground, ran the wires around the room, fed the microphone into those uh, amplifiers and those were the assist, assistive loops, as we call it, or the loop system back then. Um, so that was kind of you know, what we knew. If you look at the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, there's almost nothing in the original act about assistive technology for people that are hard of hearing. And the reason is because there wasn't anything or what was out there, most people did not know about. Um, and it was part of that omission of understanding the needs of people that are hard of hearing as being different than the needs of people who are deaf that kind of originated the Hearing Loss Association of America, which started out as self-help for hard of hearing from Rocky Stone and that. Um, you know, we have a separate group of people. Uh, to people who are deaf, what's very important to them is their culture, the American Sign Language, and that ability to have that eye contact or that face-to-face -face where we can communicate. The, the deaf community is very important to them because it gives them a chance of normality, uh, a chance to be just one of the people instead of being the deaf guy over there and if you want to talk to him, talk to the interpreter kind of thing, which is totally wrong. But keep in mind that you know, it is when I grew up in school, there were no integrated students, especially. There were, in fact, 
I can remember only one or two people in my entire career going to kindergarten to high school where we even had people of color, any kind of diversity at all in our classroom. For the students that had special education, they were on the third floor way back in the corner. And the only time we ever saw them was if we had a school-wide program and then they'd bring them together. And it was so odd the way it happened because you know, they'd be surrounded by the aides and I'm not sure if that was to protect us from them or them from us. And if we talked to them, everybody was shocked that we would know who they were because they're always stuck away in the corner. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody, hey, their brothers and sisters are people we're going to school with. Mm -hmm. And when we go over to the house, we meet them. I mean, we know who they are. It's not like this is a big deal, like you're making it out. But that was the nature of things. And I think a lot of that concept of, of that separateness was still very, very much a part of society. For people that were hard of hearing, the, the way this played into who we were and who we became, and there's a lot of denial in hearing loss. And in fact, I'm a champion of saying in my training, other than chemical dependency, I can't think of any limitation that has a greater rate of denial. But keep in mind, for people that are hard of hearing, we didn't have that deaf culture, we didn't have that language, we didn't have that identity. And you know, one of the things I think people that are hard of hearing need to be indebted to the deaf community for was just showing us that by having that, you can create a sense of acceptance for yourself. Because most people who were hard of hearing back then, they were kind of stuck between the worlds. And I know that's become a um, commonplace uh, description. But in a real sense, even for myself, when I first started out in this business, I wasn't fluent enough in sign language that I could really fit into the deaf community. Deaf culture is not my identity. So even though I did a lot of things with the deaf community and thanked them very much for the acceptance they gave me, I wasn't in a true sense a culturally deaf person. At the same time, when I would interact with people that had normal hearing, I missed enough things, I misunderstood enough things, I just plain fouled up on the communication that it wasn't unusual for saying, are you deaf? How come you're not like other deaf people? And then it's like, okay, I don't fit into this community, I don't fit into this community, please tell me where I belong. So, and, and I think that was very much a part of it. Um, I think on a national level, Rocky Stone, you know, who actually started out almost like myself, and have more normal hearing and then losing his hearing, he understood how this impacted the person's whole sense of, of identity in that. And from that, he was able to say, he had the organization skills, he had that concept of how to put things together. My understanding is he worked for the CIA. For, so he understood how to get people organized into a mission, uh, a goal-oriented movement. And with those skills and the fact that he had an awful, awful lot of uh, contact with an awful lot of people. In fact, several years ago when uh, uh, Congressman Jim Overstar came into my office in Duluth because they were putting a TTY into his uh, congressional office. And I was talking to him, and he mentioned to me that he knew Rocky Stone. And I said, okay. And he said, well, yeah, he was my neighbor. Our kids played together when, when I lived in Washington, D.C. So it was that just kind of that perfect storm of um, circumstances that brought Rocky together with the right people. And he began the concept of developing an identity and a support system for people who are hard of hearing so that they can develop enough self-esteem to begin to ask for the things they need to integrate into society. 
because so many of them were, you know, I don't want anybody to know about this. I, you know, I, I actually believe that every person on this planet has something about themselves that they spend an awful lot of time and energy hiding from the rest of the world. And for people that are hard of hearing, oftentimes it's their hearing loss. And bluffing, faking, you know, nod your head and, yeah, okay, fine. That worked just great as long as you're answering close to what the person expected you to say. Now, if you're not, you're going to get some very, very weird looks. And from the very, very weird looks, you quickly learn to, oh, that's my cue card. It's time for me to leave. <laughs> um, the problem with that is it creates a tremendous amount of isolation. And it creates a tremendous amount of loss of esteem. It creates a tremendous amount of depression. And, um, you know, that's sad because I've met so many hard of hearing and deaf people in my career that are just absolutely fantastic people. They're absolutely gifted and talented people. And the world is not seeing those gifts, those talents. They're not seeing that person that would make an excellent friend either because they lack the ability to accept that person in spite of their hearing loss or deafness or because that person has learned that it's not a friendly environment out there when you can't communicate and so they withdraw them for their own protection. Do you, did you see and do you see differences with greater Minnesota? Because you've worked, you know, you're, I know you're in St. Cloud, you've worked in Duluth and other places. Did you see that there were, there were needs there that um, could be met through the regional service centers or HLAA? I think the greatest thing with rural in Minnesota is um, it, it, it's very, very similar to the experience I had growing up in grade school and high school. You never have that exposure to a lot of people that are different, different in the sense being deaf and hard of hearing, because there weren't a lot of people there that were deaf and hard of hearing. Um, most of them have found out that it was easier to move to larger cities where you might find a deaf community or where you might find a self-help for hard of hearing or hearing loss association support group. Um, even today, 2011, the operating uh, support group for HLAA are the Twin Cities and St. Cloud. Um, so there wasn't the exposure to the people. I think that by the same token, it seems odd because never do I give a presentation or do I talk to a group of people about my hearing loss and ask the first question, how many of you know somebody that has a hearing loss? Well, all of them have a parent, a grandparent, a brother, a sister, someone that either deaf or hard of hearing. It's amazing how many times I ask them, well, oh, what kind of a hearing loss? Oh, my brother's deaf. And I said, okay, tell me about that. Well, he wears hearing aids and, uh, you know, he has a lot of assistive equipment. I said, well, does he communicate with sign language? No. So, okay, so he's hard of hearing, right? And it's amazing how many people only see hearing and deaf, and they don't see that group of people that are in between that are considered hard of hearing. Um, is that talk? Yeah, is that uh, that's the background that you brought to, or that HLAA, the Hearing Loss Association of America, then is working with? Is that is that where you say you sort of fit? Uh, it, it very much is. Uh, in fact, you know, if, if I talk to people who are, are deaf, especially culturally deaf people, um, what's important to them is to have qualified sign language interpreters or have uh, video relay services and those kinds of things so that they can do things that involve communication very much the way hearing people do. If I talk to hard of hearing people, those who have accepted their hearing loss, they will talk to you in terms of amplification devices or assistive listening devices or improving um, hearing aid, cochlear implants. There used to be a cochlear implant 
association in the United States, they merged together with people who are hard of hearing because they had so much in common. They had a hearing loss that prevented communication, prevented full access to society, but they didn't have the sign language ability that allowed them to get that access the way the deaf community does. So that group, and the biggest problem though with that in-between group is if you look at the statistics, about 10% of the people, and sometimes it will go up to about 30% of the people that can benefit from hearing aids have and use hearing aids. So that should give you an indication of the number of people that are out there either hiding a hearing loss or trying to function without that equipment, either through ignorance or simply because they don't want to be identified. Um, and then you said you talked about Rocky Stone, and he uh, talked a little bit as uh, talk a little bit more about that and about his role in, with the hearing loss. This and the is, Hearing Loss Association of uh, uh, the H the chapter that you're with in St. Cloud, kind of take us through some of that. If if I were to put my finger on the reason why Hearing Loss Association of America, Self Help for Hard of Hearing, was able to develop itself into an identified unit or an identified group, Rocky Stone was the type of individual that had tremendous self-esteem. He was confident in who he was. He did not identify himself by his hearing loss. He identified himself by who he was. Because of that, he was able to model that to other people. And, with that, and I think that's the greatest benefit of Hearing Loss Association of America. You have people who have gone down that path they have gone through that accepting process. None of us are perfect. All of us bluff. Some of us get tired. We still make mistakes and those kinds of things. But at least to a certain degree, we've come to that realization that I am a person with a hearing loss. I am not a hearing impaired person. And I think the, the, the most important thing about that is if I say I am a person with a hearing loss, then I can look at that person and say, what are my gifts? What are my talents? What do I have to offer? Be and then how can I offer that using the assistive technology and the techniques and the strategies for overcoming my hearing loss? And even not overcoming it, just being able to do things differently and still put out that person for the world to benefit from. If I say I am a hearing impaired person, I'm impaired. I'm a person that's impaired. Now, why would I want to take an impaired or a defective object and try to present that to the world? What you do with defective or impaired objects is you put them on the shelves and hope that you don't need to use them because they don't function correctly. And this is, I think, what happens with a lot of people who are hard of hearing. They don't see themselves as being a person with a hearing loss. They see themselves as a defective person, or they see themselves as enabled or unable. Um, I've seen this in my work where I have consultants that happen to be culturally deaf with excellent, tremendous skills. They happen to work with an interpreter to bring those skills to the people they serve. A lot of times, people that are older and have developed a hearing loss, when they see those consultants that happen to be deaf and working with an interpreter, they don't see their skills. They see, oh my goodness, this is the one thing in my life I most fear, becoming deaf. Because I'm having so much trouble coping with my life even with a little bit of hearing loss, my goodness, if I were deaf, I'd be a total invalid. I, I wouldn't be able to function at all. And the silliness of that is, as I mentioned earlier, it was from the deaf community 
that we got those gifts of understanding by identifying yourself, having identity, having a self-esteem, having your, your role models and that, having your community, you can actually help people to grow and develop and to become that person that has something to offer. We're going to offer it in a different way because we have a hearing loss. We're going to do things a little differently. We may have assistive devices. I may have a cochlear implant. I may have a hearing aid. I may lip read. I may have a flashing alarm for my doorbell or something like that. But guess what? I can sit here and tell you I teach Red Cross CPR to hearing people. I start my classes by explaining to them, I'm here to teach you. I have these skills. I can teach you, but if you have a question, you're going to have to get my attention first. As long as we can do that, I have so much to offer you. Good point. Good point and a good bridge in a way. Try working at finding ways to bridge different, you know, in different situations. Will you talk a little bit about the HLAA in St. Cloud and, and how that organization came about and works and some of what it does? HLAA in St. Cloud, um, it, self off for hard of hearing, the first chapter is here in the Twin Cities and um, you know, it, it had kind of a unusual infancy. Um, there was some people that had some business background in that who happened to have uh, hearing loss and some of them developed it later in life. And, but they, they understood marketing, they understood um, you know, how to present this and promote it. And so they started a little bit of group. In fact, they started meeting in a travel agency because one of the co-founders happened to own the travel agency. So they met there. Well, they had enough of a success. They had a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Nyquist. And Jeremy Nyquist lived up in Onamia, Minnesota, almost the end of the earth, or at least you can see it from there, okay? Not really, in fact, it's a beautiful area, but Jeremy was coming down to the HLIA group here, or the self of for of hearing as they call it, and um, he hooked up with a lady who is actually working as a consultant with the uh, Regional Service Center in um, Wilma, and her name is Brenda Eddy. And they had met people from HLAA and they knew about the groups and that. And so what happened is somewhere along the line, they talked to other people and, and other people got, they got enough of people together that decided we should have this in St. Cloud. And so they started meeting in St. Cloud. And, uh, you know, originally it was the same thing as you have from any other group, be it AA to, you know, cancer survivors or anything like that. You had a couple of people that came. And most of them, you know, came because they were looking for answers. And from that, they told somebody else, we were blessed in St. Cloud in the fact that we had um, one of the people that joined our group, she was a college professor with the communication disorders uh, program at St. Cloud State. And then we had one who happened to have been a teacher for deaf and hard of hearing. And she knew every student. I mean, they loved her, she loved them. Um, we also had some support from people that were with the regional service centers and that. Um, and, and I'm not going to take much credit for this because there were a lot of people who laid a lot of groundwork before I ever got there. And if, if I come across in this interview at all as having good self-esteem or acceptance, you know, it was those people that laid that groundwork and helped me develop that identity as a hard of hearing person that I'm indebted to. Um, just the idea of being able to go once a month and sit down with people who understood what I was saying when I bring up, you know, the other day I had to go to the doctor's office or I wanted to go to a city council meeting and I called ahead and told them I would need accommodations because I have a hearing loss 
And the first thing they said was, well, we provide interpreters. Now, in my situation, that was okay because I had enough sign language skills that that would bridge the gap. But for most of the people that I was sitting around the table with, they were saying, but I don't have any sign language skills. I lost my hearing when I was 40 years old from a car accident. Or I lost my hearing as I got older. I lost my hearing because I was in a very noisy environment in my farming or something of that nature and I never learned sign language. So how do we explain that to them? And even to this day, if, if I mention to someone that I need assistive listening devices or that I need captioning to go to a meeting, there's still, there's a lot of puzzlement out there because they don't make that connection that, yes, I have a hearing loss, no, I'm not deaf. Is that, how large is the group now? Talk a little bit about the organization. In St. Cloud right now, yeah. we probably have about 16 or 17 members. Compare that with the deaf club who ha has closer to 50 or 60 members. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 and a lot of this is starting to tie in with what I've said before, you know, to find those people that are willing to admit I have a hearing loss, I'm not deaf, you know, what kinds of things are out there to benefit me. Um, it's not unusual for us to have people that, um, I, two months ago, a lady stopped in at one of our meetings because we now meet in the Whitney Senior Center. You know, um, she stopped in and said, I saw the advertisement or the uh, posting for this group my husband's hard of hearing. And it's it, it very, very, I wish it wasn't, but it, it's typical that sometimes you have the children or the spouse or someone like that, or the brother or sister come in and say, you know, how do I get my husband, my wife, my brother to come to a group like this? Because he's struggling, but he doesn't want to admit that he has a hearing loss. Mm. You serve the sort of the uh, northern area or, or Minnesota, or do you pull people in from um, beyond St. Cloud a little bit? I would say if you did a radius of about uh, 30 to 40 miles around St. Cloud, that is our, our most common. Um, if we do, we've had a step, couple of state conferences in, in St. Cloud. And basically, we pulled people in from five or six states. And, um, and, and, and this is probably uh, one of the names that you hear from uh, self help for the Heart of Hearing is Tom Overland. Tom, uh, basically, he was successful. And uh, he didn't like to be in the limelight, but he didn't mind you know, promoting um, the concept of uh, self-help for the heart of hearing. So when we had our first state conference in St. Cloud in 1996, uh, Tom, out of his own pocket, brought in a, national, a nationally known speaker, Sam Triken. And um, anyone who's heart of hearing, reads anything about research in heart of hearing, probably recognized that name because he's done a lot on coping strategy. Um, so in a lot of ways, we've been blessed by you know, people that believed enough in this to actually support it so that if we had to be self-supporting, we'd have never got off the ground, so to speak. How does your organization or your, your club or group work and interact with the group in the Twin Cities? Is that a, um, you serving different areas or, I mean, geographical areas and how else generally does that work? In a lot of sense, um, we're almost joined at the hip in a lot of ways, and, and in, in other ways we're separate. As far as our meetings, our functioning as groups and that kind of stuff, we'll probably have no more relationship than maybe a couple of AA groups that are in different cities. But when it comes to things like um, the, the uh, statewide conventions, um, this October, we're going to do the Walk for Hearing, which is a national initiative for fundraising and that. 
then most of the time we'll work together. And the reason why we work together is because you know, we, we get that critical mass. Um, if I had to get the volunteers I need to run a state conference just out of the St. Cloud group, I would probably be in trouble. Uh, interestingly enough, there are probably about three people in our St. Cloud group that are younger than me, and I'm 61. So a lot of giving an idea of, you know, we're, we're small group, we're older people than that. But um, by the same token, in, in the Twin Cities, you see more of that spread of age. And I think it's simply because you have that critical mass. Um, I'm also seeing people in the Twin Cities chapter that sometimes they, they may have gotten exposed to self-help for the hard of hearing earlier. Um, we meet in the senior center, but we're not a senior group. But because we meet in the senior center, most people assume we are. And that's been one of our struggles overall in the uh, Hearing Loss Association is to get some of those younger members. It's very unusual to see uh, people in their 40s, uh, 30s coming to those kinds of groups. Yeah, but at the same time, that serves a, a distinct need in a... In it, it does. It does very, very much. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of people that are younger that are more inclined to hide the hearing loss and they struggle more because of it. Um, bluffing is a good example. Uh, if you're on a job and you want to bluff and pretend you don't have a hearing loss and that, or if you, you, one of the things that a lot of parents will ask me is, how do I get my son or my daughter to wear their hearing aids? And I, my first question is, how old are they? And if they say, you know, they're in junior high or they're in high school, I say, do you own any super glue? Because most kids that are in junior high and high school, and, and we've all gone through this too, nobody wants to look different. And so they want to blend in. And so off comes those hearing aids. The problem with that is that if, if I tell somebody I have a hearing loss, they may react badly to it, but at least they know why we're not communicating. If I try to fake it and they ask me a question and I give them an inappropriate answer, they're left just deciding does this person just not care enough about the relationship to want to communicate with me? Is he just being a smart aleck? Is he stupid? Is there something cognitively wrong with him? They have to try to figure out why that communication isn't happening. If I tell them up front why, they may react to it badly. I have no control over that. But at least I've told them this is the reason why I can't communicate the way other people do with you. And you know what? I can't change that. Um, I think. The critical thing about St. Cloud or any of the rural areas is that um, we're going to be reaching out to people that won't come to the Twin Cities. And uh, that's true of any kind of an organization. You know, you, whatever state you're in, it, the big city, it's the real people kind of thing, and, and that concept and that divide. Um, I think that's always going to be true. We're going to be able to get people that will come to St. Cloud for a meeting that may not come to the Twin Cities for a meeting, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why oftentimes we've had our state association, uh, our, our state meetings in St. Cloud, because you would never get a lot of the real people to come down here. By the same token, the thing that we're indebted to the Twin Cities people are that they are close to where the influence sometimes needs to happen. They can go to the commission meetings more easily. They can go to uh, the legislature more easily. They have a larger group, so there's that critical mass. Uh, uh, if you need to present your, your uh, story to the media or to uh, any of the legislative groups, people who are hard of hearing need some of the same exemptions from cost that people that are deaf need. Yes, we can hear, but we can't hear well enough that it doesn't take us longer to use, for example, 411 or something like that. 
so there is a need. People who are deafblind, um, oftentimes, uh, the concept of you know what works for one. So we need both groups. Um, we are blessed in Minnesota in that there isn't that us them attitude about it. In, in fact, you know, I, I think the friendship there has been absolutely phenomenal. They're willing to work together because we know that at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's not about them. It's about the people that are hard of hearing in the state of Minnesota need to have that message gotten out and we'll dedicate that, uh, that concept to that uh, mission. And so I think that you know, it's been a very, very good working relationship. Um, what do you see for the future for that? What, what I see for the future, you know, I don't see that changing a tremendous amount. And the reason why I don't see that changing a tremendous amount is because um, most of the attitudes about other groups are passed down from one leadership to another. And right now, with those collaborations between the leadership, when we have a new president in St. Con, for example, or when there's a new president in the Twin Cities chapter, uh, even the Aloha group, which is really the younger group of, of the Twin Cities chapter, th we don't say, you know, watch out for those people, or, you know, um, you know, we had this bad experience with them before. What, what we say is, you know, this, this is another part of our organization. This, this is who we can collaborate with to make ourselves stronger as a group and that. And so, Buying anything earth-shattering that should happen, and I don't foresee that happening. I think the groups are going to continue to collaborate because we know that there's that mutual dependency, that mutual ability to work together. Um, Do you work with any other state organizations, um, uh, like the uh, Minnesota Association of Deaf Citizens or anything? Is there any kind of collaboration there at all? Like, you, oh. it, does, it sounds as if there could be, but at the same time, you each have your own areas of response, of, in, you know, focus. We have the same area. We have our own areas of focus. We have mutual concerns. And as, as recently as a couple of uh, months ago, I remember going to the Twin Cities HLAA chapter meeting and Dan Trino, who is the president of the Minnesota Association for Deaf Citizens, came in and presented. He, he spoke to us about ways we can collaborate together. Um, I see a lot of people, when I go to, if I go to a, a, a Minnesota Association of Deaf Citizens uh, uh, event, I see a lot of people from HLAA. If I go to an HLAA event, I see people from Minnesota Association of Deaf Citizens. Yes, what we're advocating for, Minnesota Association for Deaf Citizens may be advocating for what the group of people need. HLAA may be advocating for what our group of people need. I'll give you an example with that. It's the movie theaters. HLAA, we want them to have the assistive devices, have the batteries, have the uh, listening devices working. For the people who are deaf in Minnesota Association for Deaf Citizens, they would rather have the captioning. But by the same token, we're smart enough to realize that if you put captioning out there, even if I've got an assistive device, I'm going to have more access to that movie. So it, it's sort of like religions or denominations, let's quit looking at what we disagree with because that's only a small part of our, our doctrine. Let's look at the things that we do agree with and that is that people with hearing loss from a mild hearing loss all the way down to deafness, we have similar needs. Our barrier is communication. We need access in order to integrate into the group. They're on my team. We have a mutual a mission here. Let's work together because it really doesn't make any difference who gets the credit. What makes a difference is who gets the access. So that's my concept. Am I going to sit here and, and pretend that everybody has that same attitude? No. But I, don't, I, I can't control what everybody else's attitude is. But what I can do is continue to say, you know, we've got a lot of things 
that we have as mutual interest. Let's work with those. Uh, Minnesota Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I remember when we first started with the Regional Service Center, we were called the Regional Service Center for the Deaf. I remember when uh, the Minnesota Commission first started out, they were called the Commission for Deaf, and then it was the Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing, then it was the Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. The idea is that as we realize that there are other people who share some of the same problems that we have, communication access, we can do a lot better pulling together than trying to fragment out. And we're not strong enough alone, but we're strong enough together. And, and that's not strength in the sense of let's beat somebody over the head. But the more we can communicate to the general public out there that hearing loss, vision loss, people who happen to use a wheelchair and that, that's not just a very, very small segment of your population. A large segment of your population has some form of special need or accommodation need. And when you build a society that's accessible to everyone, everyone can contribute. I just, just detest this idea of the reason why we're making these accommodations is so that these people have a chance to participate. No, no, it's not about participation. It's about contribution. Um, several years ago, I was involved in an in initiative get TTYs into the Minnesota rest stops. My idea and my communication with the Department of Transportation was not about if I need help, I can make a phone call. But what I told the commissioner at one point was, what if I happen to be driving down the road and I see that you've had an accident and you need help? When I get to that rest stop, do you want me to be able to call and get you that help? My, it's not about my participating in your getting help. It's about my ability to get the help for you. I can be involved in the, in the process, and that will benefit you. Sure, there might be somebody else that passes by that can pick up that phone and make the phone call, but what if they choose not to? Wouldn't you rather make sure that anybody would be able to get that help coming. And, and I think that, that idea is it's about our being able to offer something to the society that nobody else is able to offer. I'm the only me there is out there. Advocacy? Advocacy, you know, again, advocacy a lot of times gets a bad word because it almost comes across where people say, advocacy involves, you know, you're making me do something. No, no, what I'm doing is I'm asking you to allow society to involve 100% of its members. That's what I'm advocating for. I'm not advocating for something special. I'm not advocating for something that you don't deserve. I'm advocating for everybody getting the equality, everybody getting the same deserves. That's what my concept of advocacy is. Um, and I know that sometimes it's not always comes across that way. But you know what? I don't think there's anybody on this planet that whatever group you belong to and you find near and dear, be it your church, your club, your association, your, your friendship, your circles or something like that, that you don't have people in each of those segments that are good people and some that eh, they could use a little work on, on their bedside manners. Advocates are the same way. There are some that do a very, very good job. There are some that come across kind of crass. But let's not lose the message in the personalities. Let's realize the concept of advocacy is about this is a society and it's a society of all these people. Let's make sure 100% of them have something to offer.
and something that they can equally contribute. So, You've been doing this, as you said, for, thir what, 30-some years? Actually, I've been with the state of Minnesota for 29 years. Um, and needless to say, I was probably involved before that. Um, yeah, I've been in the line for a long time. Long yeah. time. Take, uh, what are some of the major changes that you've seen looking back through your work with the regional service centers and the other wor and the volunteer work that you've done? Are there any major changes that you've seen that you in, in that time that your advances? And then also talk a little bit about the future, what you'd like to see coming. The major changes, I think, were that when, when the regional service center started out, we were the regional service center for the deaf. And, and part of that was because they were the group of people that was most separated from society. We didn't realize that at the time that there was this other group of people called deafblind that probably had a lot more need. But most of them, remember when I started in 1982, we still had the concept of institutionalization. So most people that had the, the more um, the uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, developed need uh, or the more intense needs or the greater amount of needs, uh, whatever you want to say, such as deaf blind, they put them in an institution and serve them in, in a, an assembly line fashion. Um, so for a lot of sense, the people that were out in the community were those that were hard of hearing and those that were deaf. The people that were deaf still have more barriers at that point in time because of the advances in technology, the um, ADA wasn't even passed at this point in time. You know, so that was where we started out. Once we got to a point where they were elevated to some ability to participate in society, and it wasn't 100%, and it's never going to be 100% because you're still dealing with, uh, with attitudes and that. But when that came, then people that are hard of hearing because of the concept of HLAA and self help put hard of hearing, they began to develop that same type of, of uh, a sense of identity, sense of, you know, it's okay for us to present our need as being different from deaf and hard of hearing. Don't rob Peter to pay Paul, but as equally important to be addressed because we need to participate too. Once that very, once that was crossed, then it became the sense of, but what about these people that are deaf blind? They shouldn't be, if they need intense services, provide the services to them. But don't use the concept that they need services and help at a greater level to isolate them from the ability to participate. And so I, I think that was the evolution of it. In the future, if I was, if I had a magic wand and none exists, what would I like to see? I would like to see a society that says, you know what, irregardless of differences, this person still has something to contribute. Let's do what we need to do to allow that contribution to happen because it's going to make society stronger. And so. You, you hinted on about the Minnesota Commission for Deaf, mm -hmm. Deaf Blind and Hard of Hearing. Um, I think one of the, one of the great um, accomplishments of that group was in the beginning there were a lot of people who were deaf or professionals that worked with people who were deaf on that group. And they addressed the needs as they saw them. As they began to get hard of hearing people, and Bonham Cross was at one time the chair. Um, some of the others have been chair. As they began to come in and participate, you know, and, and had a seat at the table, they brought their need, and the commission was good about saying, what do we agree on, and how can we advocate so there's a cross the board. When the people who were deaf blind were allowed to come out into society, because they were no longer isolated by those barriers that were imposed, then they could take a seat at the table. Somewhere down the line, we may look at things like 
who knows? People that have deafness or, or hearing loss who also happen to be autistic, also happen to be you know, cognitively challenged, also happen to be you know, severe and persistent mental illness. They probably have some unique needs that I don't know about. When we bring them to the table, we can listen to those needs and find out, okay, in the future, when I'm advocating for access, how can I make sure that the people who are deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing, their needs for access are addressed, but also these other segments that I may not know about. If I walk into a building within three or four minutes, I will be able to tell you if there's visible smoke alarms in that building. First thing I look for, because it's important to me to know, will I be able to be warned? If you ask me after an hour in that building, are there braille numbers on the, on the uh, doors for the uh, offices? I don't know. <laughs> but if I bring my friend who happens to be deaf and blind in, within the same three or four minutes, she's probably going to be able to answer that question. I need them at the table to tell us how can we do a better job at advocating for 100% access, 100% uh, participation in, in society. So I think that's my concept of why the commission is, is a viable resource to the state of Minnesota, a viable resource to the uh, country for that matter, because a lot of the things that have happened in Minnesota have been transferred to other parts of the country. We have always been a leader, and I think we should be proud of that. We shouldn't sit down and, and congratulate ourselves, but we should say, you know, as long as we're a leader, let's keep leading. Anything yeah. else you'd like to add? Anything I'd like to add, you know, I, I realized that there are some people whose attitudes will never change. There are some people that will surprise themselves. As I grew up in Mankato, with the exposure I had to people who were different, people that had any kind of limitation, people that were deaf or hard of hearing, I developed my concept of, you know, what role could these people play in society? I think that with the Regional Service Center, the Commission, with the ADA, with all the other groups that are out there, and please understand, I give equal credence to the Minnesota uh, you know, Alzheimer's Association or, or the Disability Council, any of those groups, anybody who's out there presenting the message to people that, yes, I'm different, but yes, I'm a person and I have something to contribute. You know, that to me is so valuable to us as, as a society. Um, you know, and, and from day one, when I associated with the Regional Service Center, all my associations with the Minnesota Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Deaf, Deaf Blind and Hard of Hearing now, I still, I'm old enough that I have the wrong concept. You know. But the, the, the problem with it is that Yes, I've had some disagreement, but it's not the disagreement that we have to build on. It's the agreement. And so, you know, I've seen that change over the years. I have so much faith in the society as a whole, in the state of Minnesota, um, in, in humans in, in general, that I think that you know, most people are basically good people. If they can begin to understand the person they'll be accepting to. That's my hope. Thank you. You're welcome.